Amen. Oh, what a beautiful Sunday morning. It's all the way around, isn't it? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for his presence. Thank the Lord for that sacred uh, ordination service. Thank the Lord for young men answering the call. So, I've had a call to preach on my heart since I was 10 years old, and I thought the Lord would come before I ever got a chance to fulfill that. <laughs> Here we are, 45 years after ordination. <laughs> Just, I think Becky and I were maybe right here, or, or maybe right here. I'm not one of these spots right here. <clears throat> God is good. God is good. So, Well, this week in our Bible studies, we have been in the book of Esther. <clears throat> so we have worked our way through, and this morning I will be reading in a little bit uh, chapter number 4. Um, when we get there. Father, thank you for just being in our midst. Thank you for coming, meeting needs, touching hearts. Thank you for ministering to each of us. And that is our, our prayer and our desire that whatever it takes, we want to serve you, do your will, be all that you want us to be. Help us in this service. Lord, use this word for your honor and your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Esther chapter 3 ends like this, And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed, completely baffled, very puzzled, at a loss for a way out, filled with uncertainty. Because the, God, the good man, the faithful, loyal patriot, Mordecai, has been ignored and forgotten and the evil, self-centered bully, Haman, has been chosen and promoted. And a certain group of people, minding their own business and contributing to the good of the king and the kingdom, have been chosen for destruction. And the evil men are now partying, and God is silent. And no wonder the city has been thrown into chaos and confusion and puzzlement and bewilderment. One translation says they simply reeled from the news. And there's always perplexity when Haman is promoted and is in control and controlling the king and the palace. And the holy man is shut out. And good men are perplexed and mystified and shaking their heads in disbelief and reeling from the news when Haman is chosen. And when carnality is preferred or chosen or overlooked, the church and the soul and the movement just kind of careens down the road, reeling from the choices and heading for an inevitable crash. The preacher of Ecclesiastes expressed his perplexity like this. I saw in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, Iniquity was there. There was evil in the courtroom. And even the courts are corrupt, he said. That sounds like it could have been written this morning. And we've all seen people and churches and denominations make some perplexing, devastating choices. Perplexing and devastating for their own souls, for the souls of their children for souls of, for the future generations. What perplexing days we live in. And it is so perplexing to be living in the days described by Isaiah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You see, first we overlook evil, and then we permit evil. And then we legalize evil. And then we promote evil. And then we celebrate evil. And then we begin to persecute those who still call it evil. And more than ever, we need men of God to stand up and be counted and stand in and stand for righteousness and for truth. And to the men of Shushan at this, in this day, it was all so confusing and so perplexing 
to see men who were living so peaceably, treated so barbarously. But Jesus tells us that in the end times there will be distress of nations with perplexity, with wars and rumors of wars and civil wars and uprisings, all nature in chaos, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and there will be perplexity because no one knows how to solve the problems of war and of our economic woes and of the natural catastrophes. Albert Einstein said the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. So what do we do and where do we go when there's no place to go? And what do we do when evil is triumphant? And when the wicked are in charge, and when the foolishness of men has gained the ascendancy, and when racial prejudice is ruling the day, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you read back through Esther chapter 3, it illustrates that, that the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And the plot against the Jews in Esther chapter 3 is the background of the events in Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to, to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king and to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Atak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And again Esther spoke unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days." And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, day, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way, and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So we must 
look this morning at the star character of the book of Esther. Look at the Esther character. Look at the Esther principles. <clears throat> Wherever there's a people of God, there are enemies of God. And an enemy also forces a reassessment of priorities. Am I willing to be stirred from my comfort zone? What am I willing to do to defeat the enemy? Am I willing to expose and deal with evil Haman? And the moment Haman surfaces, Esther begins to move from being a beauty queen to becoming a Jewish saint and from living the indolent life of the harem to becoming a passionate intercessor. In chapter 3, the king was stupid and Haman was evil and Esther was ignorant and Shushan was perplexed and the Jews of the provinces were, were weeping and fasting. And it really looks like the whole plot is all sewed up without any escape except for the one man who saw the whole situation clearly. And when Mordecai learned what had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. When Mordecai got a hold of the decree, he gazed at it till his eyes were a fountain of tears and he studied the situation till the iron began to enter into his very soul and then he made his appeal to Queen Esther to do as she ought to do. And although this saying is attributed to, to a man much later than Mordecai, he demonstrates his belief that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. But he, Mordecai, was not willing to stand by and let evil triumph. The Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, adds the prayer of Mordecai at the close of chapter 4 after verse 17 is found in the apocryphal book of Esther. Mordecai prays this, O oh, thou knowest, Lord, it was neither in contempt nor pride nor for desire for glory that I did not bow to proud Haman. I would have been content with goodwill for the salvation of Israel and the safety of the Jews to kiss the soles of his feet. But I did this that I might not prefer the glory of man above the glory of God. Neither will I worship any but thee. And we admire Mordecai for standing erect when the crowd all fell flat on their faces. I think a little phrase from the book of Nehemiah ought to be our motto, whatever others may do. He said, so did not I because of the fear of God. But don't stop your reading at the end of chapter 3 or you'll be filled with utter despair. Lots of times we can't see it, but there's a way with God. We're troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. The prophet Isaiah said, O oh Israel, the Lord who created you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. And when you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. And when you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt and Ethiopia and Seba as a a ransom for your freedom. Others died that you might live. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Don't look at the situation only through your eyes. Remember Israel at the Red Sea, Pharaoh pursuing the mountains, hemming them in, the sea before them, but God made a way. Remember Deborah and Barak facing Sisera and his 900 chariots of iron and 20 years of Midianite oppression until one day Deborah decided that enough was enough and God used jail and her nail to make a way for, for relief from their oppression. 
Let evil take heed when the Spirit of God begins to move on one surrendered heart. When Nehemiah got the burden of Jerusalem's broken down walls on his heart, God made a way to rebuild them. And, and once God begins to burden us, we become responsible to act and to enlist others and to put our hand to the work and to stand firm until he relieves the situation or releases us. In chapter 4 of Esther, at first Esther is unaware of the problem until Mordecai acts in such a way as to make her acquainted with the problem and urges her to deal with this problem, and then she eventually becomes willing to deal with the problem. And when the Holy Spirit makes us aware of some deep inner need that we haven't seen before, we are responsible to deal with it because nobody else can, and we must. And we have to be willing to deal with the problem, and until we are, nothing will change for the better, but only for the worse. First day, remember I told you about a commercial down our way from the local hospital about some kind of diet plan, and their little motto is, nothing changes if nothing changes. And that's true. It's just true in every area of life. Nothing changes if nothing changes, and nothing was going to change in Israel with the Jewish people in Babylon except for the worst unless somebody, unless somebody saw the need and took the responsibility for it. And there are crisis points, and there are defining moments in every life, and this is one of those moments in the life of Esther. She has to decide who she really is. She's the only person in the book with two names. In chapter 2 and verse 7, she is called Hadassah, which is her Hebrew name, and Esther, which is her Persian name. That's an indication of the identity crisis that she faces. After being raised as a Jew, she is thrust into the king's court, and she must live as a pagan. Her Jewish, char her Jewish character told her to obey Mordecai, which meant paradoxically that she must deny, uh, that, she must deny uh, that character and live as a Persian. But while she pretends to be a pagan, she is controlled by circumstances. And now she must renounce that pagan Persian way of life and identify herself as one of God's people. And after her decision to identify herself with God's people, Esther becomes the active agent in the story, commanding Mordecai, planning a strategy to save her people, and even confronting Haman directly to his face. And her decision energizes her and gives her purpose and emboldens her to face a very threatening and uncertain future. I tell you, the gospel always confronts us with a decision whether we will continue to live as pagans or to identify ourselves with God's people. Our choice defines us who we are and with what people we will identify. And the choice to be identified with Christ that energizes our lives and gives us us purpose and, and becomes bigger than our concerns and our problems and gives us a hope beyond uh, ever perishing. And there's a point where we can no longer halt or hesitate between two opinions. Will we go <coughs> it, 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 the way of least resistance or will we go God's way? That is a crisis point that every one of us has to face in our lives. Will What will we do with Haman? That is really the theme of the book of Esther. What are we going to do with this man, Haman, who would like to destroy our lives and do away with our spiritual living? Only Esther could deal with the situation. It was her responsibility. And there are times when God puts us into a certain position with certain needs, and we become responsible. It's our responsibility to deal with it. I don't know if Brother Blowers remembers this, but several years ago, back when he was still pioneer supervisor, and I had a, a, a problem and a need that I went to him about and said, what do I do? He said, you are in charge of that, and you have to deal with it. Well, thanks. I wanted him to wave the magic wand and deal with it. That taught me just an excellent lesson, and, and I just had to own it. I had to take responsibility on it. Esther 
That's essentially what Mordecai said to her. You're there. God's put you there. And it's your responsibility. And you're going to have to do something about it. She diligently began to prepare herself as best she could to deal with it. Fast for me, and I also and my maidens will fast. And under the providential hand of God, she chooses the the proper occasion. She uses discernment. She follows the prompting of the inner voice. And we'll get into that in, in the coming chapters. She began to move at God's time. She moved in cooperation with God, who was preparing both the king and Haman. And the reason Esther could act so responsibly to the saving of her people was because she had early learned a humble respect for authority. For when even when chosen and installed as queen, Esther did not yet uh, uh, reveal her nationality because Mordecai had charged her or commanded her. She was still following Mordecai's orders just as she did when she was living in his home. And I tell you, we never get too old nor in any position where we do not have to follow orders from some higher authority. And she always maintained a humble, teachable spirit towards men and towards God. Her position never made her too high, too mighty, too superior in her attitude. Another reason Esther could act so responsibly was because she was genuine and authentic. Even when the world was at her feet and she could have anything she wanted and order anybody to do anything she wanted to do, she refused to succumb to the temptations all around her to be superficial and selfish and seductive and self-centered. Her life did not revolve around her physical appearance nor how to make an earthly king happy nor how to please herself. She was where she was because she She knew God's hand was on her life, and she was in this this place at this time for a reason. She couldn't see it as yet, but she trusted God. The character of Esther was the exact opposite of Haman. He was all that was evil. She was all that was pure and good. And she learned to make the best of of an unpleasant situation, or at least a situation that was not of her choosing. There's an interesting verse back in chapter 2 and verse 9 that says, And the maiden pleased him. That was Haggai. And she obtained kindness of him. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. That simply means that she lifted up grace before his face. Though she'd been kidnapped and, and, and brought to the king's harem and forced to participate in this whole business reluctantly, she never displayed a sour attitude. She was a model of God's keeping joyful grace. Her inner qualities begin to shine forth. Peter puts it this way, who's a... Adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. In other words, it's your inner disposition that God is most concerned about. We're chosen by God to show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. She had human fears. She faced reality. But she has firm resolve. If I perish, I perish. I will go to the king even if it is forbidden. This was Esther's moment of full surrender to the will of God. And I tell you, the Spirit gently leads us and urges us and He yearns us to this point. As Mordecai did with Esther, he urged her. He, he, just, he, he yearned over her. He spoke firm words to her that she would just face her responsibilities and act responsibly and do what she was called to do. And when, when once she knew her course, she never deviated or turned back. You remember, you are familiar with the name Elizabeth Elliot. Her husband Jim Elliot and four of his friends were speared to death by the Aki Indians. Sometime later, 
She felt the call to go live among those people who had murder her, murdered her husband. And while, while she was making that decision, she said, if a duty is clear, the dangers surrounding it are irrelevant. And that's how, that is how Esther felt. If I perish, I perish. And so with courage from above, she did not fear to expose the wicked Haman. She lived for, she promoted a cause that was bigger than herself. She learned to, to love others and live for others instead of just for herself. From the human point of view, everything was against Esther and the success of her mission. The law was against her because nobody was allowed to interrupt the king. The government was against her because the decree was that she was to be slain. Her sex was against her because of the king's attitude towards women it was absolutely worse than horrible. The officers were against her because they only did things to get in good with Haman. The fast that she was on and uh, uh, for those three preceding days was against her because without food and without drink, she could not embrace her strength or rise to her beauty. But I tell you, if God is for us, who can be against us? The devil will make everything seem to be against you when God can work out all things for good to them that love God. And he means all things to be for you if you will be for God. God, all things will be for you. Things don't just happen to us who love God. They're planned by his own dear hand, then molded and shaped and timed by his clock. Things don't just happen. They're planned. We don't just guess on the issues of life. We Christians just rest in our Lord. We are directed by his sovereign will in the light of his holy word. We who love Jesus are walking by faith, not seeing one step that's ahead, not doubting one moment what our lot might be but looking to Jesus instead. We praise our dear Savior for loving us so, for planning each care of our life, then giving us faith to trust Him for all, the blessings as well as the strife. Things don't just happen to us who love God, to us who have taken our stand, no matter the lot, the course, or the price. Things don't just happen, they're planned. And so what would you do this morning if, if being obedient risked your very life? Are we willing to face an uncertain fate, an uncertain future to be obedient? Are we willing to commit without knowing the whole future, without knowing any of the future at all? It's easier at the moment to choose the safe way, but we miss the blessing of obedience and the satisfaction of doing God's will and the joy of the Father's approval if we choose for the immediate instead of the long term and the eternal. And I can testify as well as many of, of, of you can that God's way is the very best way. My life has been blessed beyond measure. I have absolutely no regrets in following Jesus. Oh, I tell you, there's been a few little rough places along the way, but all in all, such a blessing, such a blessing. Things that he withheld, I didn't need. Things that he gave me and allowed to come my way, he has used them for my good, for his glory, for the refining of my soul. So the Esther character is one that is formed by grace and molded by God. It is one tested by the trials and circumstances of life. It is one that is shining brightly in the darkest darkness. It is one that is standing tall in an untoward generation. It is one that is fully surrendered to the will of God. We are brought by the faithful spirit to the defining crisis of our spiritual life where we must settle our spiritual identity as to which kingdom we belong to and, 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 and as to how we are going to live. And the Esther principle is acting responsibly and rightly regardless of the cost or consequences to ourselves. And by God's grace, uh, at the urging of Mordecai, who in this book is the type of the Holy Spirit, dealing with that Haman principle of evil in the kingdom. 
You see, when God wants to do an impossible task, He takes an impossible person and crushes him. And the question for us this morning is this, are we eligible material for an impossible task? Are we ready to be used by God in, in God's way and in God's time for God's purpose? I tell you, every one of us is in the kingdom for such a time as this. It's not a pleasant time on the world scene to be in the kingdom, but it's a glorious time to be living for God. And we're not, live, we're, we're not here for such a time as this just for the big notice, noticeable things. We are here at this moment by the will of God to live for God and to exert a godly influence even when it's all unbeknownst to us, yet others are affected. And even in the little things of life. We are here for such a time uh, as this. And the challenge is this, to maintain an Esther character in a Haman world. One writer reminds us that heaven defines the risks that we take for our Lord as faith. We see a risk as unsettling and perhaps frightening, but when we are deep in the center of God's will, even a risk is safe. So I want God's way to be my way as I journey here below. For there is no other highway that the child of God should go. Though the road be dark and rough, if he leads me, tis enough. I want God's way to be my way every day. Neath the burden and the trials, though my heart may weary be, and in weakness I am yearning from all toiling to be free. Though through this lonely veil of tears, he'll give grace to calm my fears, and I want God's way to be my way every day. All the choosing and the planning, I must leave to him all wise, for what air is his appointment will but good for me devise. If it is God's will for me, twill no disappointment be. I want God's way to be my way every day. I choose, I choose to serve him. I choose to say whatever the cost, whatever the consequences, I choose him to be my God. I choose to live for the side of right and righteousness. I choose God's way to be my way and I choose to allow him to choose my way and, and, and I choose Choose to follow him, whatever the cost may be.